Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, July 2nd, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, Terror Panic USA. The mainstream media, the Pentagon, the DHS, and the FBI are all on high alert as they warn the nation of possible terror attacks this 4th of July. Then, Dianne Feinstein demands internet censorship after the FBI uncovers their own bomb plot. And the Obama administration moves forward on unconstitutional measures to nationalize the police. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Our government has always wanted to maintain the illusion of freedom above all else. But now the illusion of impending danger is more important to them. Can they make you hold these cognitively dissonant concepts in your mind at the same time? A kind of Orwellian doublethink to think that you are free and enjoying your, your life here in the United States and yet at the same time run to them cowering in fear for the latest protection with the police state, with the military on the streets of our cities. That's what we're going to see this July 4th. An article that came out from Reason is, don't be terrorized by your government this 4th of July. The run up to this weekend has been filled with one fear story after the other from both the government and the media cooperating with it at the same time. They point out that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are warning us that there's going to be a heightened threat of Islamist terrorist attacks. Now, this week, of course, it's the terrorists that are going to be attacking us. The rest of the time, we have to be concerned about those people who want limited government, you know, the uh, Tea Party, those patriots out there. They say CNN is reporting law enforcement officials believe that the Islamist threat is the, quote, highest in year. And, of course, CIA deputy director turned CBS security analyst Michael Morrill declared, I wouldn't be surprised if we were sitting here a week from today talking about an attack over the weekend in the United States. That's just how serious this is. Is it really that serious? As Reason pointed out, there's only been 68 Americans that have died since September 11th in terrorist attacks, and that includes 13 in the Fort Hood shooting by itself. And of course, that was a military base where they had disarmed the soldiers because they cannot be trusted to carry their sidearms. Well, along with them, just as Americans cannot be trusted to keep our weapons with us, according to those who want gun control. They point out Americans are 69 times more likely to die taking a bath rather than from terrorism. Nevertheless, we have these representatives going on all the different mainstream media. Look at this story here. Uh, this is from Steve Watson. Terror panic representative says New York officials expecting a dirty bomb attack on July the 4th. And of course, this is Megyn Kelly on Fox News working with Representative Peter King, one of the biggest neocon fear mongers and pushers of the security state and the police state you can find anywhere. So he goes on Fox News with Megyn Kelly and he says, you wouldn't see the nuclear explosion devices being used the way they are if this was just a routine warning. And then Megyn Kelly picks up on that and says, did you say nuclear? And he says, yes. That's a big problem here in New York. Nuclear explosives, the dirty bomb. Okay, so besides sounding like some kind of Cold War hysteria, this reminds me very much of the staged back and forth between uh, then Representative uh, Markey, he's now a senator from Massachusetts, and Lisa Jackson with the EPA, where they had prearranged this thing to sell the public that fine particulate matter, you know, your barbecue smoke, or maybe your fireworks, that that was equivalent to cancer in this country. She said to Representative Markey in these hearings, she said, there's more people dying from this than from cancer. If we could solve this, it would be more significant than finding a cure to cancer. And he actually knew that's where they were going because he mentioned cancer before she said that. And he said, wait, did I hear you say cancer? And she says, yes, I said cancer. So he said, nuclear bomb, dirty bomb. And Let's be honest here. They will do that at some point. We know they will do that. They've got a lot of nuclear devices. A lot of them have gone missing. That will be the next step when they're ready to roll this out. But right now, they've got everybody in such a state of panic that people are looking everywhere for attackers. And of course, this happened today. An active shooter was reported at the Washington Navy Yard yet again. Remember, that was where 
The uh, shooter went in. He said that he had heard voices. He had carved on the stock of his gun, this is my uh, ELF uh, device or something to that effect. In other words, he believed that he was being uh, mind controlled. And of course, the uh, uh, CIA has talked about using extremely low frequencies to do just that. But never mind, that was uh, just a terrorist attack. But this was not. This was not a terrorist attack. They say there was no chase, no report of injuries, no sightings of anyone with a gun at the Navy Yard. That was, of course, local news after uh, national news hyped it up. And of course, we see, as we look at these pictures that are coming from CNN, it is a lockdown, a full militarized lockdown. When anything like this happens, they go totally over the top. And as CNN points out, as a preventive measure, officials closed Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House because we have to protect the president. And the paranoid government is not only selling you fear, they are genuinely paranoid. Look at what they have done here. This is RT showing the new spikes going around the White House. As some people have said, uh, pointed out, the White House and Obama actually can build a fence when they want to. And so they're making this one uh, pretty fortified. Uh, they said the White House is relying on a medieval solution. Yeah, they want to keep the peasants out with the uh, pitchforks, you know, the peasants and the serfs, those who are taxed at a rate that is about five to six times what the peasants and serfs of medieval times were taxed. They say they describe this as rows of pencil tip pieces of metal facing outward at a five degree angle. The spikes are placed over the existing fence beginning yesterday with contractors finishing the job today. This morning, the Secret Service and the National Park Service agreed on the temporary security enhancements back in April. A proposal for a permanent new fence is under review, and construction may begin as early as next year. Now, when we go back and look at what they were talking about back in April, the Washington Post had this headline. They say, agency votes for spikes on the White House fence, but a moat has been ruled out, because that was seriously suggested by Representative Steve Cohen, Democrat of Tennessee. That was back in November uh, when they got to April just uh, three months ago. They ruled that out. They said, perhaps, uh, he said at the time, we ought to look at a barricade of water because, you know, people were jumping over the fence a couple of times. Before we had an empire, it was common when America was a republic for people to just walk up to our presidents, to our leaders. It was possible even up until the Civil War. We had a, a fellow who came over from England and he walked all the way through the South, all the way up to Washington, meeting all the different political leaders, meeting Sam Houston in Texas meeting the leaders of the uh, uh, different sides personally. And this was in the middle of a civil war. People were not that obsessed with security. But now that we have an empire, that is the way they act. We have to have a Praetorian guard. Now, there's no threats, as, as antiwar.com has pointed out. There's no actual threat. Nevertheless, we see security ratcheting up. And they point out that it's not only... Uh, the Department of Homeland Security. It's not only Peter King and Megyn Kelly with Fox News, but we've got the FBI Homeland Security. Representative Mike McCall predicted several, quote, small-scare ISIS attacks. I, I don't know if that's a typo from antiwar.com or if that was a Freudian slip from uh, Mike McCall. I think that's supposed to be small-scale ISIS attacks, but I think it really fits better with small-scare ISIS attacks. They say terrorists have not used July 4th as a particular date to carry out in past years over the decade-long war of terror. So why would they look for it now? But they are looking for it. Look at the way Daily Mail hyped this, the loyal mockingbird press. Their headlines, the sick ambitions of a caliphate bent on carnage. Chilling map predicts where ISIS will strike in the West with long lone wolf attacks as FBI sets up 56 centers to monitor 4th of July terror threats. So not only do they say that. They show us a map. And of course, ISIS has been busy tweeting out this map because that makes them look big, or perhaps because ISIS and the federal government are connected so closely. They say the FBI is setting up command centers in all of its 56 field offices across the country ahead of the July 4th weekend to monitor any potential terrorist attack law enforcement sources have revealed to them and told to Fox News and to Daily Mail. Now, this is our analysis of it. Kurt Nemo writes a story, FBI exploits the baseless 4th of July terror threat to establish command centers. It's actually a pretext to build and expand the surveillance grid because these 
command centers have been around with us for quite a while in this war on terror. We used to call them fusion centers. Remember the 2009 MIAC report from the uh, fusion center? That was a story that was broken by InfoWars, and that was where they were looking at people who had just voted in the election of 2008 uh, for Ron Paul or Constitutional Party candidate Chuck Baldwin or others. They were looking for people who were patriots. Those were the people they were looking for at the time, not uh, Islamic terrorists, and they have continued to say that that is not their main focus, Islamic terrorists. Their main focus are people who would be opposed to this government politically. Kurt Nimmo points out that although the government admits it has absolutely no credible evidence that ISIS or anyone is planning to attack the United States over the 4th of July, the FBI has nevertheless moved to establish command centers around the United States. The command centers, he says, will integrate local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies so that officials can gauge the threat level and respond quickly. And he points out these command centers really are fusion centers around the country. They have been routinely used to monitor political activists, not supposed terrorists. The centers often work hand in hand with the private sector to undermine First Amendment rights of American citizens. Let's remember, going back uh, two years ago, back in 2013, this article that we ran, talking about the New York Times' article. See, everybody knows that the FBI is hatching most of these terrorist plots. And that even the New York Times admits that. We've had Judge Napolitano point that out. We've had Mother Jones point it out. We've had the New York Times pointing it out. And so we covered that article when they came around to mentioning it. Uh, of course, in April 2012, the New York Times said terrorist plots hatched by the FBI. They revealed that many of the high-profile terror attacks foiled by the FBI were, in fact, fabricated from start to finish by the FBI itself. They say the U.S. has been narrowly saved from lethal terrorist plots in recent years, or so it seems. But all these dramas were facilitated by the FBI, whose undercover agents and informers pose as terrorists, offering a dummy missile, a fake C-4 explosive, a disarmed suicide vest, and rudimentary training. Suspects naively played their parts until they were arrested. It's all smoke and mirrors, folks. That's what it's been so far. Just remember three months ago where Dianne Feinstein demanded that we have internet censorship because the FBI had done, had staged an event where they leaked a document and she said that document should never appear on the internet. So she uses the FBI's linked document in a staged semi-pseudo attack to say that we ought to have censorship of the internet. After the FBI uncovered another one of the self-orchestrated terrorist plots, this is just three months ago, leading to the arrest of two women, Senator Feinstein demanded online censorship of the literature that the FBI had published. And let's not forget where this is all going. This is all going to support the idea of a nationalized police force. Of course, they've been using the war on terror to extend what they had started with the war on drugs, removing our due process corrupting the police, corrupting the legal system, but now they have taken it even farther. We have seen an infrastructure of tyranny, legal and physical, enacted in this country. That's what all the massive hoarding of ammunition by the federal government is about. That's what the pre-positioning of militarized assets in small towns all over the United States is about. And of course, it's about militarizing the police. As the New American points out, Obama's unconstitutional schemes to nationalize the police, they say before openly complaining about the militarization of the police, Obama was militarizing them at an unprecedented rate. At the same time, he was attacking the rights of Americans with slogans like, quote, weapons of war don't belong on our streets. Now, in that, he was referring to what they call assault rifles, which is a vague definition we all know. Nevertheless, he was talking about individual firearms that are recognized as a fundamental human right by our Second Amendment. So he says weapons of war don't belong in the street, but he was flooding the streets with real weapons of war at the same time. Tanks, armored personnel carriers, grenade launchers, and even more, they say, to the local police. And after the unrest in Ferguson, much of which was fueled by Obama ally and financier George Soros, as shown by an in-depth investigation in the Washington Times, Obama started complaining about the very militarization that his administration had been engaged in. 
So they released what they call the Task Force on the 21st Century Policing to study the issue, and guess what they said? Yeah, we need to nationalize the police. Russia is looking at this as well because, you know, every government wants to maintain an iron fist, an iron hold on power. The, Wash the Russians are looking at this and saying, uh, MPs, this is reported by RT today, MPs are proposing granting police exceptional rights in Russia. They say a group of Russian lawmakers have drafted a bill broadening police powers and giving them the, quote, presumption of trust. Wow, that sounds familiar. We don't actually use those terms, but that's essentially what we have here. The police can be trusted. You, however, are a terrorist until you prove otherwise. Of course, you don't need any ID if you're going to vote, but for everything else, you must show your identity papers and prove your innocence here in the United States. Of course, Russia wants to do the same thing. They're just, you know, the Russians are just a little bit behind us in tyranny right now. They say, among other things, this would allow them to break into cars and homes without warrants and open gunfire at mass gatherings of people. Oh, what's the problem? The Russians don't have a Supreme Court. They've got to make a law. You don't need no stinking law to do that. Just look at the way we did it in the United States. We've got the Supreme Court that makes pronouncements. We create a war on drugs. You don't need to actually bother the MPs with any of that. They need to uh, get with a program. <laughs> they need to follow our example. Well, so much for our independence. Of course, this next week, Right after the weekend, we're going to see if the Greeks will vote for their independence. We're going to see what the information war and how that is shaping up in Greece right after we come back. Stay with us. Now, as I said just before we went to the break, this week could be independence for Greece on July the 5th. But as we're leading up to that referendum that's going to be held in Greece as to whether or not they're going to go with the uh, payment plan that's being put to them by the banks, that will essentially be a referendum as to whether or not they want to stay in the EU as well. At the same time this is all going on, of course, the uh, rest of the European press is painting them as irresponsible, as profligate, as people who are basket cases, welfare cases. Nevertheless, they want them desperately to stay in because we understand what this is about. This is a giant reverse mortgage and they're not finished getting their hooks into the Greek people yet. There's still some more stuff that they can loot if they can keep them in there long enough. Very much like the kinds of contradictory information that we're hearing on these trade agreements, where we're told this is going to be a great deal for us. The economy is going to boom. America desperately needs this. That's the same thing every government is telling their people while they keep the agreement secret. Because if it really was a good deal, they would show us. But every one of us are going to get screwed with this because this is for the benefit of the large banks and the multinational corporations. Again, Daily Mail comes in and says, the big fat Greek gravy train, a special investigation into the EU-funded culture of greed, tax, evasion, and scandalous waste, making the point that they have a very large welfare state. And yes, there is a lot of waste there. It is by design. Remember what Cloward and Piven said. They wanted to create a massive entitlement state so that they could use that to collapse the country and then establish socialism, and also for the bankers to take all of the assets after the collapse. Of course, we've also seen this with the World Bank in the 1960s, where they were accused of rent-seeking because they were going to all these third world countries and telling them to set up a very elaborate welfare system. Don't worry, we'll finance it for you. Easy payment plan, just like you do with a kid right out of college, giving them a credit card account. And then, of course, the whistle was blown on all that back in 2002 with Joe Stiglitz, who worked for the World Bank. We talked about this yesterday on the radio, how in 2002, Greg Pallas talked about his interview and documents that he had about the World Bank, about the IMF, his interviews with Joe Stiglitz. He did that on the Alex Jones Show, and, of course, there was a transcript of that put into Alex's 2002 book. 9-11, Descent into Tyranny. And if you're a Prison Planet subscriber, you can download that and read the uh, PDF copy of that book as well. This is a known strategy. This is the way they've been working. We showed that 13 years ago, and it went on long before that. As I pointed out, that was a strategy back in the 1960s for the World Bank. So to complain about Greece and saying it's a big, fat Greek gravy train, at the same time, the BBC comes out and says, the Greek debt crisis 
no vote won't lead to a better deal. This is the best deal you guys are going to get. So there's a massive campaign, both by the people who are the leaders of the EU finance groups, the finance ministers, everyone else, to tell them, go ahead, take some more debts. We'll keep uh, extending and pretending, as Max Kaiser pointed it out. A different uh, editorial comes from the US, from USA Today. They say it's no tragedy if the Greeks leave the Eurozone, in their view. They say a return to the drachma would allow Greece to be Greece. They say the answer lies in the peculiar collection of nations known as the Eurozone. These countries share a monetary system, but not a political one, which is a recipe for trouble. Do you see that? That's the fundamental issue right there. And that's why these uh, these crises are happening right now in the Eurozone. We've already had Alan Greenspan, former head of the Fed here in the United States, as well as the head of PIMCO, the largest bondholder in the world, saying that the only way this is fundamentally going to be solved is if the European nations surrender their sovereignty to the center. Crisis solution. That's what they had planned all along. And of course, USA Today sees that as well. They understand that you can't have a non political non-sovereign union, and yet have a monetary one at the same time. That creates a problem. Their answer is for Greece to leave. That would be my answer as well. That's the answer that many people have said. Of course, Joe Stiglitz as well, who was the whistleblower as to what these uh, international finance organizations were up to. They say the answer is yes. Greece would have more control over its money. They should leave. They should just be Greece. And of course, in Greece, we see the Greek government who wants the people to uh, uh, make this decision. Of course, they put it up as a referendum. The uh, Greek finance minister says that if they vote yes to accept the deal that is being offered by the euro uh, bankers. In a trio of articles from RT, they look at how politicians are reacting to this. And of course, the Greek finance minister says, I would rather cut off my arm than agree to the current deal. He says, if they pass, if they vote yes in this referendum coming up on July 5th, he will resign, and the uh, a Green Party MP says that it is economically diluted, that the Troika wants to punish the party that's in power in Greece, the Syriza party. She says, Greece's government debt to GDP ratio has not gone down as austerity was imposed. It actually went up. In other words, the austerity that they have tried has actually made this worse. It's not going to help for them to do more of the same thing. It's just going to get them further and further in debt to the bankers who will use that to take all of their assets. She says, they seek to humiliate and to defeat a government which has dared to stand up to the ide ideology of austerity. And another quote from her, she said, they want to entirely strip down the Greek state and refashion it as a servant of capital rather than of people. No, it's not, and of course, uh, they're coming at it from kind of a leftist standpoint, it's not making it a servant of capital it's not even a problem of capitalism. It is crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is not a free market situation. It is actually a plan for global governance by these multinational corporations and the banks, the same ones that are pushing these trade partnerships. Finally, uh, RT says it looks like Greeks will vote yes over bailout terms. These are polls. And this is the same sort of thing, however, we saw before the referendum in Scotland on independence. They create these polls. These are essentially can be used as push polls to try to move people in that direction or to create an anticipation for the result that they have already decided and will make happen. Now, they point out this poll was conducted by BNP Paribas. They say that is France's largest bank. Oh, no conflict of interest in that poll at all, right? The arguments in favor of a yes vote grow every minute the ATM machines don't dispense money. Funny how that works out. Of course, you create a liquidity process uh, problem, and then they have to shut down the ATMs and wait a few days. So that effect sinks in on the people, essentially holding a gun to their head. We'll see who controls the voting machines, because that's the next thing we have to worry about. Not who controls the ATM machines, but the voting machines on July 5th. Stay with us after the break. We're going to take a look at the new Mockingbird social media. The mainstream press is failing, so they're turning to social media to shape public opinion. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, how is the First Amendment doing this 4th of July, or the Fourth Amendment for that matter? The NSA is now going to be resuming its dragnet surveillance. You thought that was over? Of course it's not over. They're coming back, and of course they're coming back with a secret court authorization. 
The story that's up on Infowars.com from New American Secret Court revives NSA bulk surveillance. Mass surveillance can carry on as before, at least for now. There'll be some minor adjustments later on, but right now they're going to go back to exactly what they were doing. On June 29th, a secret court ruled that a federal court and Congress were wrong to end the NSA's bulk collection of phone metadata. Therefore, the mass surveillance can carry on as before for now. And of course, who is that secret court? Well, that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, created as part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Where did we get that? The irony is, is that the FISA uh, Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, was created in response to the Church Committee hearings back in 1975. In those hearings, we saw what the CIA was doing. In the Pike Committee hearings in the House, we saw what the NSA was doing. As a matter of fact, we got a glimpse of the fact that the NSA existed for the first time. And of course, they premiered with the understanding that uh, they and the CIA were eavesdropping on Americans. So what they did was they created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, said, we're going to keep intelligence, we've got to have these intelligence agencies, but they're going to be limited to foreign actions. You're not going to let you spy on Americans. How's that working out for us? It didn't work out too well, did it? As a matter of fact, William Colby, who was director of the CIA then, probably one of the most transparent uh, directors we've had of the CIA, he showed the family jewels, and for that he got fired and replaced by George H.W. Bush. George Bush's son, W., in 2008, amended the FISA Act and created the monster that we see today, of course, it wasn't just that stroke of uh, legislation. It had been going on for quite some time. He just legitimized the criminal actions that they had been engaged in for decades. Now, as I point out in the article, the so-called FISA court, and it's not a court, it is a single individual. There is no uh, uh, antagonist there arguing for the other side. It's simply a single judge, and the government goes to that single judge. But they nevertheless maintain the fiction that it is a court. It is a court in the same sense that the Star Chamber was a court. They say the so-called FISA court is now used as a tool for rubber stamping unwarranted surveillance from the Bush administration on. Of course, we give the credit to Obama, but it's something that uh, Bush really amended the law. And again, that was to give them cover for something that had been doing for decades. And this is what the FISC judge said, he said, the Second Circuit rulings are not binding on the FISC, and this court respectfully disagrees with that court's analysis, especially in the view of the intervening enactment of the USA Freedom Act. So I guess there's kind of a silver lining in that. You know, there is a division of power again in Washington. But instead of it being the executive, judicial, and legislative branches, the division of power is the CIA, the NSA, and everybody else. And guess what? Everybody else doesn't matter. And he points out, he, he finishes up with this summary. He says, the court that was established specifically to judge the merits of applications by the government to spy on citizens gave a green light to the NSA to keep spying on Americans, ignoring completely the will of the people, of their representatives in Congress, and the plain language of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Welcome to America on this 4th of July, 2015 weekend, where we now have a completely secret government. And of course, that USA Freedom Act is going to reform the abuses we've seen from the FISA court, because now when they make their secret decisions, it, they're going to tell us what they've decided. The trial will still be secret. It won't be an adversarial relationship. They'll still say that they are and have the power to amend the Constitution, to shut down the courts, to shut down the Congress, to ignore the Constitution. But they'll tell us, they say, when they're going to do that from now on, unlike the president's secret executive orders, his PPDs that we talked about yesterday on the radio. Now, how are they selling all of this? Because the mainstream media is losing not only credibility, but audience. John Rappaport points out on his uh, blog that they're going to use it with social media. They're turning social media into the Mockingbird Press in some very unique ways. It's Facebook and Apple. We're going to take a look at both of these. He points out in one of these uh, blogs that he's got, Facebook becomes Godzilla news outlet for disinformation. And this is what he has to say about the mainstream media, and which is very good the way he put this. He says, every large mainstream news source is in the business of disinformation. You know, the Mockingbird program from the CIA. 
He says stories with no context, outright lies, omission of vital data, claims of overwhelming consensus on issues where no such consensus exists, internal censorship of their own budding investigations into high-level crimes, disguised partisan opinions. They manufacture the reality for the government, for corporations, for others who control society. Now, when they're using social media, people are getting their information now more from social media than they are from the mainstream press. 64% of it coming from Facebook, he points out. Over one and a quarter billion people use Facebook's platform. So now they're coming up with a program called Instant Articles. He says this is the basic setup. They're going to have mainstream media outlets put their news stories on Facebook's platform. By that simple transfer, more than a billion Facebook users will see these stories, will absorb them, believe them, accept them. It's a lifeline for traditional media companies that are hemorrhaging viewers and readers. So basically what they do is they put a new trendy face on the same old tired propaganda. But he points out that Apple actually has another approach on it. This is the new operating system coming out, iOS 9, and they're talking about a new news service that they're going to embed in the next iOS for iPhones, iPads, etc. They say Apple News, part of the upcoming operating system from Apple, aims to be the primary news source for users of iPhone and iPad. Apple says its new uh, news app will follows over a million topics and will pull relevant stories based on your specific interests. Through the awesome power of default, says uh, one analyst of the Journalism Lab, he says Apple's distribution puts it in an entirely different league. This news app will be on hundreds of millions of devices within 24 hours of its debut. Now, John Rappaport breaks it down. He says, listen, this is what they're really doing. They're profiling us down to our toenails. He said, Apple will present the public with a virtual bubble of what they want to see and read. He says, so, you're an Obama fan? Here's stories confirming your belief in the prophet. You want neocons on the rock with a little bit of conservative Republican twist? Here's some war footage that'll warm your heart. Or, you're tuned into celebrity gossip? Here's your world in just three minutes. And he points out, this is really decentralized centralization. Because what happens if you're one of those fringe users? Let's say that you're doubtful about GMOs. Well, don't worry. They'll give you a story that tells you how Whole Foods is planning a healthier produce section. So cheer up, nothing to worry about. And don't, you won't see any news about how Maui shut down GMO growing uh, on the island because they didn't want to have contamination of the non-GMO crops from Monsanto. If you're anti-vaccine, forget about it. They're not going to give you any information. They might give you, as he puts it, a piece about a little unvaccinated boy who was involved in a car crash on I-95. That's the way they're going to control the news. It'll still be the same old recycled mainstream media stuff, but they will confine what you see by doing it through your phone and by doing it through Facebook, making it easy, making it free for you so they can push their agenda on you. Now, when it comes to trying to get information from the government, when we actually have somebody who's trying to do journalism, we know that we get hit all the time with a stone wall. You can't get anything out of the government. Columbia Journalism Review points out what happened to a citizen, not even a journalist, a citizen who asked his own government for some information that he was entitled to. The title of the article is, uh, When Governments Sue Public Records Requesters. They did not only did they not give him the information, they turned around and tried to get punitive with him, tried to sue him over this. They say, when you send a public re records request to a government agency, you might expect a delayed response. You might expect high cost to fulfill it, even a denial. But you probably don't expect to be sued by the agency. Yet, that very thing happened recently in New Jersey, prompting a judge last week to dismiss the suit and conclude that a public policy that enables the authorities to sue a requester would be the antithesis of open government. But, you know, what we have is the antithesis of an open government, absolutely. In this case, a private citizen sent a request to the Hamilton Township in New Jersey. Now, he was entitled to that information under the Open Public Records Act and the state common law right of access to public records. But a few weeks later, instead of responding to him, they sued him and they asked a local court for relief from any obligation to respond. So it wasn't just a legal tactic, however. They also came after him for attorney's fees. <laughs> That's what they did. They sued him for attorney's fees and said, we're going to establish this in court that we don't have to respond to you. 
He narrowed his request. Well, maybe it's too broad. He narrowed his request, but they refused to drop the lawsuit. So there you go. On this 2015, we've got a government that's not only created swarms of officers and sent them among the people to harass us and to eat out our substance, but they now have that kind of arrogant attitude if we even ask what they're doing. They're not about to show us. And if we ask, they just may sue us and try to recover financial uh, payment from us for having the audacity to ask the emperor about what he is doing. Well, that's it for our news tonight. If